All right, can everybody see that? Yes, looks great. So we are gonna talk about uh, cabinets of curiosities today. Uh, and we're really gonna focus on this, this first kind of intro room at the museum, which is called Strecker's Cabinet of Curiosities. And a, and a cabinet of curiosities wasn't necessarily just one cabinet. Uh, it was, it could be a room uh, full of odd and interesting things, whatever uh, the person found interesting could be all over the world. Uh, and this exhibit really is to give homage to um, the way that natural history museums looked around the turn of the 20th century. Not many things uh, in a lot of these places, not many things were labeled because uh, really only educated people were allowed into these places, whether they were public or private. And you already were supposed to really know what most of the things were uh, without having labels there. Um, so we did, we tried that in 2004 when we opened the building um, and we got continuous comments that, but I don't know what any of this is. It doesn't have any context. And one thing we know about objects, museum objects, whether they're specimens or artifacts, is that the best objects have stories associated with them. And if you don't know what the thing is or um, where it came from or who collected it, then there's, there's not a whole lot of context there. So what we did was added an interactive kiosk uh, so you could look up everything in the room and dig deeper if you wanted to. These were a few slides that I made for a, a presentation that we did for the Texas Association of Museums meeting and we really wanted to talk about weird things in your collection and how you can build relevance to to today uh, in this new age of exploration uh, which for a lot of us is uh, the use of technology and technology at your, at your fingertips which presents the same problems that it did in the 15 and 1600s which was is the stuff real or not um, there's a there's a question of what what is real and what is truth and that's the same question today when you're lo looking on the internet is it real and so this is one example uh, this is the the museum of Olaus Worm in Copenhagen and that's a that's a drawing from 1655 and then a a more modern interpretation of those those things that were in that drawing. So taking a look at the things that were in the drawing and trying to figure out what they actually were and make a new drawing. So a cabinet of curiosities is a cabinet which comes from the, the Italian Gavinetto, uh, a room stuffed with art, scientific specimens, and curiosities. It really whatever the collector found interesting. And some of these listed unicorns, horns, giants, bones, Egyptian mummies, human skulls and skin and fossils, some of which we know or we think we know now are real or not. So some different categories. These can be objects of deep emotion. Um, which are interesting to people. Um, the idea of reality. So is a jackalope real or is it just interesting and quirky to look at? Maybe it has historical significance and that's why it's curious or interesting. Um, or maybe it's just weird. And here's one of those in our collection. Um, a bobcat head from about 1900. Um, not, not sure why uh, we still have it, but it is fun and interesting to look at. So these are pictures from a, a trip to England. Um, and this was in Oxford. And um, 
you can see there on the left, a this is the oldest ham in the world, which is surprisingly young. If you're going to find the oldest ham in the world, this is from uh, 1898, I think. And it is, no one has been able to top this as the oldest ham in the world. So it has a whole history about it. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll see how it tastes. But um, here at one of the museums in Oxford also is, is a curiosity. It was a curiosity when it was collected and it's a curiosity now. It's one of um, Darwin's um, Galapagos tortoises. Some other things from England, you see a, an early drawing and then a photograph, it's not a great photograph, of a horse's jaw or a donkey's jaw that a tree root grew around. And this drawing is, I think, from the 14 or 1500s. And then you see the real thing on display. So you can connect these uh, things through history and see how people have represented them, how they've interpreted them. Here's another curiosity in the middle. Um, this is supposedly the lantern that was used by Guy Fawkes in the gunpowder plot in 1605. So his historical significance, it's just curious to look at something that connects directly to a major event in history. And then you see a, a 1799 pamphlet about uh, the display of Oliver Cromwell's head, which uh, if you don't know the history of Ol Oliver Cromwell's head, it's, it's a roller coaster. So just get ready. Um, so he, he beheaded uh, Charles I, and then he was subsequent, sub subsequently beheaded and buried. Actually, he wasn't beheaded before his first burial. He was buried with uh, a state funeral. And then when Charles II came into power, his body was dug up, beheaded, his head put on a pike and reburied. And then uh, it was dug up again and lost and found and lost and found. And then in 1799, you see this, this pamphlet and it's since been lost again and uh, no one knows where it is. Interesting. So like I said, good stories make good objects and, you, and the reverse is true, I think. Good objects make good stories, but you can't make up stories about an object. So you see our cabinet of curiosities here. And then a classic, uh, you know, hodgepodge of all different kinds of things. These are historical artifacts, they're biological specimens, they're uh, scrimshaw, they're, they're dried animals, minerals, all these things. And then you have my daughter there with her curious face. Some of this stuff, even if it's not labeled, is interesting because it's weird looking. So we have a collection of autographs of all different kinds of kinds of people, just juxtaposed to what our database calls uh, natural glass, which is um, the record that we have says that this piece of glass was found in the desert and it was due to a lightning strike. So when a lightning strikes sand in the desert, pure sand, you get natural glass like this, sometimes. So you see John Strecker here uh, with his uh, bone pile about 1926. And he's, he's the director, he was the director from 1903 to 1933 and really built the collection um, uh, in the early part of the 20th century. And he is who the, the museum was named for and who our current exhibit, which was created in 2004, is named after. Now, you see the sloth up here. This is a, a mother and baby sloth that was stuffed sometime before 1926, I think about 1910. And things like that keep reappearing 
in our exhibits and in photographs of our exhibits. See if you can find it there. It's currently on exhibit. Another thing that keeps reappearing is our humpback whale skull and, and partial skeleton that we have. This is a, a photo from 1905. Um, the whale was collected, it washed up on a beach in Brazil in 1901, I believe, and was shipped back to Texas by a Baptist missionary. And this is a picture of it arriving on a on a flat car in Waco. So it was shipped to Galveston, put on a flat car, packed with sand. You see it's just laying there on, on sand. And when it arrived in Waco, uh, Strucker said that it, it still had a very ripe smell. Uh, so still needed a little bit a little bit of work when it when it got to Waco in 1905. And that's been on continuous exhibit as far as we know since 1905 and as an icon for people that, that come to the museum. You see, this is where the museum was housed in Carroll Science Hall in 1910. And you can see the back of the whale skull right there. Keeps reappearing. And then on exhibit at the Cotton Palace, uh, which I think everybody on this call probably knows what that is, so I'm not going to explain the Cotton Palace, but um, uh, it was like a, a fair, a state fair, um, certain times of the year, and curiosities are always appear at state fairs. Back then it was called a, a finback whale, now called a humpback whale. And here is it uh, in, its, in its modern position. Another curiosity that greets you when you come in uh, the museum today is Stan. And Stan is a T-Rex that was found in the Black Hills Formation in South Dakota. And uh, this is a, a cast, this is a replica. And you, you may know that uh, the, the real fossil of Stan went up for auction in the fall and sold for $31 million. And the Black Hills Institute uh, that owns this fossil or, or did own this fossil made uh, copies of it. They own the rights, they basically own the copyright to the fossils and, and the, the casts that were created from it. And uh, each one of these models uh, runs between 100 dollars and $200,000 if you wanna buy a copy of it. And we got this one on loan from the Perot because they had, you know, they have extra T-Rexes. So they just let us borrow one, which was very kind of them. So as you go into the Cabinet of Curiosities room, you, you may miss this one. Um, I think his name was Babe, still is Babe. And he was given by the Strasburgers who live in Temple, I believe. And uh, this was one of their their prize longhorns. And it, this photo doesn't do it justice, but it, I think it's six and a half or seven feet uh, tip to tip on there. Um, and they said this, this animal was very friendly, very docile, very calm, but he just had a habit of, he, you know, he just wanted to, to look around and he would just stab, he would stab and kill the other longhorns just because he was looking around. So, we thought that was an interesting enough story and a, and a local story that we don't highlight longhorns very much in our building, but we thought this one was interesting. So down to, to some, some of our specific curiosities that people always love to hear about. And some of you know more about these than, than I do even, but <clears throat> you see in the jar, this is a hawk's foot and someone found it curious enough, found the story interesting enough that they preserved this hawk's foot and put a note in the jar that said, I believe their, their pet weasel 
uh, was running around on the ground, this hawk came and picked it up and the weasel killed the hawk in the air. And both the weasel and the, and the hawk fell, fell to the earth. And here's what you have left. <laughs> it's this, this story and the hawk's foot. Um, then you have the scarificator, which was an 18th century invention. Uh, we, we've all heard about bloodletting um, as a way to balance your humors um, that, that physicians often performed um, to, to bleed a patient. Uh, and this is the kind of instrument that was probably used on George Washington when he was sick. It probably didn't help him. Uh, but it is a, it's a brass spring-loaded contraption with razor blades and you put it up against your wrist and press a button and it, it cuts you. So, um, I would not advise that. These are very hard to clean too. So we talked about jackalopes a little bit. This is not a jackalope. This is what's called an orthlock, and orthlocks are only native to the Waco area. And the difference between a jackalope and an orthlock is that a jackalope generally is just a rabbit with antlers. A jackalope is more complex. A jackalope has maybe raccoon parts, sometimes uh, birds, in this case, a goose bill. And then you see uh, one of our favorite curiosities, um, which was originally called, uh, when people saw these, they, they called them cyclopses. And uh, I won't ask, does anybody know what it is? Because I know people on this call know what it is. This is a, a baby elephant that we got from, from the zoo in the 70s, I believe. Um, and eye holes are on the side and that cyclop, cyclops hole in the middle of the forehead is like your nose um, where you, you have two holes in your nose uh, that are just a hole in your skull really and that's that's the hole for the trunk and you can see the little baby tusks right there Some other curiosities that that do need context if you just saw these in the gallery and you didn't know what they were they don't mean much but if you know the story behind them it gives them context and a connection back to history so you see a, a log with pieces of iron embedded in it um, and the this is a section from a tree at uh, Chickamauga and it was the battle of Chick Chickamauga in the civil war and this was collected as a war relic um, during the first part of the 20th century and has lead and uh, iron shot stuck in it from that battle. Then on the right, you see cuneiform tablets. These are soft stone that were inscribed. And this is how messages were sent and how history was documented uh, around the time of, time of Abraham. So these are some of the oldest pieces. If you, if you don't count fossils and minerals, these are some of our oldest artifacts that date uh, between three and 4,000 years ago. Still in great shape. We have a good collection of scrimshaw, which is always a, a, a highlight for curiosities. Uh, on the left, you see a, this is an ostrich leg bone uh, that was used as a spear and does have some pretty cool scrimshaw on it. And then you see a cribbage board that's made out of a very large walrus tusk. So people use these as, as art and as entertainment and as communication. Here is a small part of the Pat Neff gavel collection. Pat Neff was the governor of Texas and he was president of Baylor University um, after having graduated in, I believe, 1898. 
but he had a large collection of gavels, um, all with significant history behind them, uh, whether they were carved from the doorstep of Washington's headquarters somewhere, um, or Sam Houston's favorite peach tree or something like that. And then you have all, all kinds of materials that were used. You see ivory and different kinds of wood. And then you see one there with, uh, with a, a lead bullet from the Civil War embedded in it. Right there. And often there are things hiding in, in the cabinets. Uh, the nature of these rooms and these cabinets is there's all kinds of stuff mixed together and it's, it's very eclectic and sometimes it's crowded in there and things hide. Um, this is a, uh, a beetle that was preserved in the La Brea tar pits. And uh, very well preserved, um, but you might miss it if you're walking past. Here you have a, a freeze-dried coral snake, always fun. You have a belt buckle, again, from the Civil War with a ball lodged in it. You can imagine that left a bruise. And you have one of the things that we highlight a lot, which is the uh, one of the keys to the suspension bridge, the Waco suspension bridge. lion skull. Always fun to show skulls and teeth as curiosities. And just to creep you out a little bit, um, I don't know how old this guy is. Uh, it's a marmoset and, and a... So a, a tiny primate with uh, some charisma there. Always been on display and always a, a favorite. And then you you have a a piece of volcanic stone that's been carved. And it, does anybody see what shape that is? And we don't have much information on this one other than that we didn't carve it. Uh, and it was found uh, it was found like this. That's a tarantula. And, and a very well done tarantula, if I might say. More sculptures, these are listed as paper mache sculptures. Um, and you might ask why, why are these curiosities? And it's because of the story behind them. These are paper mache sculptures that were sold as curiosities during reconstruction. Um, these are made out of Confederate money which was completely worthless, less than worthless after the Civil War. And so they ground it down and made statues out of it and sold them because that was the only way they could use the money. Uh, so you see a bulldog and a pig here made out of Confederate money. And this, this is a, um, it's called a Venus flower basket. And we always ask people, where do you think this came from? Who do you think made it? And people will give all kinds of answers. Um, and, you know, from silkworms to, um, you know, fiberglass manufacturer, this is some sculpture from a fiberglass uh, manufacturer. It's actually the skeleton of a sponge. So this is a natural production and uh, really a marvel of natural engineering. Uh, I, I put right here uh, a link to, to an article that, that highlights this. So I can drop that in the chat um, later, but these grow in deep sea trenches. And it's really, these, it is made out of glass and as the, the sponge grows, it uses the acid from the water and builds this skeleton out of glass. And uh, there's a commensalistic 
relationship between the sponge and a shrimp that lives inside it. And the shrimp grows with the sponge and never leaves the sponge. Anyway, there's a whole story. If you're interested in sponges and shrimp, there you go. We move into our Cretaceous Sea room, which is kind of an extension of curiosities. And uh, we talk about how uh, Central Texas was covered by a shallow sea for most of the Cretaceous, which is why we don't have very many dinosaurs. Dinosaur remains in Texas because it was underwater. But we do have marine reptiles. And this was a I believe a plesiosaur that was found um, below the Waco Dam when it was being constructed. So after it was constructed, you had high volumes of water flowing out and this was eroded out of the bank by all of that water from the dam. Uh, so you can see what was around in central Texas um, and, and why you may not have wanted to go swimming on the beach. And here we have kind of a, a prep, a prepping display because um, a lot of people don't know how much work goes into these fossils before they can really even be put on display. So we have casts from the Waco Mammoth site and from other sites. This is a, a pliosaur fin or flipper um, that's about five and a half, six feet long. And you can see this is kind of an, an artist's rendering of what a mosasaur or a plyosaur might have looked like. And this is um, based on the size of these flippers that you see here. Everybody finds ammonites in Central Texas um, in these Cretaceous outcroppings, which again are marine deposits. So everything that you find in these deposits is from the ocean, which is why you on your on the playground you find little shells, little oyster shells, and everything, and snail shells and things like that, because these are all taken from Cretaceous gravel pits. Um, and ammonites were living creatures, and they grew uh, just like squid or octopi today, but uh, they had shells like snails. And here are some different kinds of ammonites and nautiluses that lived in the Cretaceous. People love meteorites. This is a meteorite, meteorite that landed in Mart, Texas, so locally. And it was considered interesting enough that uh, the Smithsonian wanted to take a section of it. So the Smithsonian now has a section of this meteorite that landed in 1893, 1890s at some point. And uh, they kept a section of it and then made a cast of it. So we have, we have the larger chunk and a cast that was made from it. And we do still collect. Uh, you might ask, you know, we have, we've seen all of this old stuff, but do you collect things now? And the answer is yes. And this is uh, a mountain bluebird that was collected by one of our staff um, during the, the snow apocalypse uh, several weeks ago. And the only reason that we have it is because it was, it was probably blown down with those cold fronts. And uh, they found it dead on their property and brought it in. And this, this is, these are the kind of specimens that we salvage. We don't go out and uh, with a shotgun and collect <laughs> the way they used to, but we do get salvaged specimens and that's how we got this. All right, do we want to stop for a Q&A? Absolutely, Trey. Oh, this stuff is so fascinating. And even though mo a lot of us, and especially me, walk through that cabinet, you know, cabinets every day or so, um, still to get to see the behind the scenes of each item is is so cool. And we definitely do have some questions here in the chat. And what I'll do is I'll just start at the top and work my way down. Um, so Trey, what is your favorite artifact in our collection? You know, I knew this, I knew this was going to come up. 
and I should have thought about it. Um, we have we have an ocelot, which is like a between a house cat and a bobcat in size. Um, and we and it was it's taxidermied, but it's listed as the the last one of the last ones from Central Texas. Um, and so I, I think it's really interesting because those are things that were very common around here, but you don't see them anymore. Um, and that's usually because someone says, what's that? I don't know, shoot it. And then that's how we get it. Um, so that one, I, I like that one a lot. Um, I think our, our whale skull is one of my favorite. Um, just because of its size, and when you when you show when you show that to kids, and they say, "Oh, that's big," and you say, "That's just the head." Um, imagine how much this thing weighed. You know how how big is your head? Okay, now now look at that thing. That's just his head. So that's always fun. That is, and that is mind blowing even to me. The the sheer size of that thing. And then I have the question, um, you've mentioned the word scrimshaw a couple of times. What exactly does that mean? Well, I'm not an expert in scrimshaw, but it usually you're taking a tooth or ivory of some kind, uh, whether it's whale teeth or walrus or elephant or another kind of tooth, and you're inscribing with it or carving uh, using ink. Uh, so you you make all of your carvings or your inscriptions or your drawings and then rub ink into it. And that's, and you get a, you get something that lasts a long time. Oh, wow, that's interesting. And then um, Gabby was wondering, where is the real fossil set now? And I believe she's referring to Stan. It was bought by an anonymous donor. I don't know where it is now. Um, Sometimes it takes a long time for those things to get moved. <laughs> so it could still be at the auction house or wherever. I'm, I'm not sure. You'd, you'd probably have to Google that one. Awesome. And then let's see, um, Madeline was, was wondering, what is the oddest curiosity that we have on display? On display, hmm. Well, I, I picked some of the oddest ones that I could find. And so I'd say that marmoset, that little monkey is odd. It's very odd. Um, we do have some, some things in storage that are interesting as well. Um, we have a zombie pig, which is a peccary wild pig shoulder mount that's been eaten by rats. And so I show it sometimes as a curiosity uh, and say, you know, this is, um, this is, this is the zombie pig. Uh, it's been eaten, but it, it still looks alive and it, and it's glass eyes, you know, kind of stare you down. So we've got things back in the back that we bring out occasionally. But. Oh, wow. Well, I bet, I bet there's some very interesting items in there. Um, let's see. And then about how many marine reptiles are in our collection? That's a good question. We have some complete ones that, that you saw. Um, I'd say three or four good examples of co complete animals. And then you find pieces of them all over the place. So I, I don't know if I could guess how many individual animals we have in our collection, but we have lots and lots of pieces you, you find a tooth here, uh, you find part of a flipper here or, or a vertebra. Um, a lot of times people find the jawbone, pieces of the jawbone that have the teeth in them. Um, if you Google Mosasaur teeth, you'll find all kinds of things that people have found. Um, but yeah, probably three or four whole animals that we've found. Oh, wow. 
And then to go along with odd, um, what is probably the rarest item in our collection? Well, this bluebird is uh, fairly rare for this area. It's a, it doesn't, they don't live here. The only reason we have it is because of that super, super once in a century cold front that came down. Um, as far as other rare things, um, again, something I should have thought of, thought about ahead of time. Uh, <laughs> so many awesome things. I'm sure it's hard to think through all of them. Yeah, I would say um, some of those war relics are are interesting, and I I didn't show nearly all of them, but. Um, we have, let's see, we on display in another part of the museum right now, we have um, some little carved peach pits that were carved by, they were whittled by Sam Houston. So he tended to do that uh, and just gave them out as gifts to people he knew, but there aren't many of them around. Um, so if you find a whittled peach pit somewhere, you know, it could be, could be from Sam Houston. And then another question is, what are some things that we do to care for our objects and specimens? What do y'all do with all those once you get them in that case or get them in that storage shelf? Well, we do constant monitoring and both for, for pests and, and environmental monitoring, like relative humidity and temperature. And uh, our collection staff uh, has data loggers everywhere in the building and they take constant uh, readings on everything so we keep a close track on everything and uh, we generally um, cabinet of curiosities is a special case because those are some of the oddest things and have been on exhibit for a long time but generally we try to rotate things out so they're they don't get display fatigue either from ultraviolet radiation or uh, just dust from people. Um, a great example of that was when the Smithsonian um, took uh, the Star Spangled Banner, the original Star Spangled Banner off of display. It, I don't know how long it had been on display, but they took, I don't know, 50 or 60 pounds of denim lint off of it uh, just because of all the, the blue jeans and denim that people had walked through the gallery and it had just settled on the flag. Now it's a huge flag, but to take that much dust off of it uh, tells you how, you know, how objects change over, over time if they're left on display. Oh, wow, that, that is amazing. And then um, I have this question and it's from a slide, um, several slides ago of uh, Strucker's bone pile. Um, there's two skulls at the where he's sitting on that table. There's two skulls on the bottom shelf that look a little otherworldly. Do you know um, maybe what those skulls are of? Those are our alien skulls. <laughs> they really and, look like that. Uh, there, there are human skulls in that photo, and there are uh, sea turtle skulls. And those, those we like to we call alien skulls, and see see if people just go along with it or if they question us on it. But yes, sea turtles. Okay, well, they, they definitely do look otherworldly, that's for sure. I think that's all the questions we have in our chat so far, and I know you have a little bit more to show us, but if anybody has any other questions as we go along, please uh, put them in the chat and we'll read them out for Dr. Crumpton. Indeed. All right, I am going to share this video. Just let me know if I need to turn the volume up. Hey everyone, I'm coming. And this is an example of how we've kind of pivoted in 2020 and 2021 uh, to create virtual programming. And we're doing that in all areas of the museum. And what, this video is an example of what we've done to highlight uh, our exhibits and our collection. From the Cabinet of Curiosities exhibit in the Mayborn Museum. And Today, I want to talk to you about the ostrich. Um, 
So I wanted to take a chance and show you some of the pieces from our collection associated with this here ostrich. So fun fact, the ostrich egg is actually the largest egg of any bird in the world. And this is Madeline. She was a graduate student. So ostriches are the fastest running land bird, getting up to the speeds of 43 miles an hour. Their single eyeball is larger than their entire brain. And they lay community clutches of eggs, up to 60 eggs, and the dominant female is the one that stays on the clutch. So also in our collection right here, these are called gizzard stones because an ostrich actually has two stomachs. One is the gizzard, which has all these tiny rocks I'm gonna to talk to you about. And then the second one is for digesting food. So as you know, ostriches don't have teeth, so they don't have anything to chew their food up with. So what they do is they find any hard object they can, normally stones, and they swallow them and they keep them in their gizzard. And so these rocks over time, they, they grind together and they grind up the food into digestible pieces that go to the next stomach. And then the stones erode over time. So they have to continually swallow these stones throughout their entire life in order to live. So just an example of some of the things that we have in our collection. Um, some fun facts about the ostrich. And I look forward to talking to you soon. Take care. All right, I'm going to stop this so it doesn't. That might happen. So um, goes along with all of our work here in Waco uh, on the Waco Mammoth National Monument. And the, the Mayborn is a partner with the city of Waco and the National Park Service. And we are the repository of all Waco Mammoth material. And again, objects and specimens are interesting because of the stories that are behind them. And the Waco Mammoth National Monument has one of the largest collections of Colombian mammoths that were in a single area, close together. Within about 100 feet of each other, we, we found 26 mammoths that we know of. And every time they drill down uh, for samples or for supports for a building, they hit more. So who knows what's really under there uh, in addition to the 26 that they've already found. So we are creating a, a mammoth display uh, from a lot of local specimens, not necessarily mammoth site material, but uh, this mammoth skull here was found in Dallas in the 60s when they were excavating for a building. And we've paired it with an African elephant jawbone that you see there to show what the lower jaw looked like on these animals. Um, they're very similar. They had different shaped teeth. But other than that, uh, they're, they look very similar. So that's a lower, an elephant lower jaw. And then we've just uh, this week put on display a collection of fossils from gravel pits um, around Waco. And these are all from the collection of Clifton Robinson and uh, donated or loaned to us by him. So you see mammoth teeth here. Um, these are mammoth long bones, ends of, uh, ends of long bones, and then a part of a bison horn that were all found in gravel pits locally here. And a close up of this is one mammoth tooth that's still set in part of the jaw here. And so imagine um, probably at least six of these 20 to 30 pound teeth in your, in your mouth. Um, and up here you see it, this is a mastodon tooth. And you see the difference between a mastodon tooth and a mammoth tooth. They ate different things. Mammoths ate mostly grass, so they had finer teeth that could grind uh, grass. And then mastodons ate woodier brush, like tree bark and twigs, and woodier vegetation, so they needed uh, heavier enamel on their teeth. All right, that, that's the end of curiosities. Um, now it's time for our commercials. And 
the so we've kind of decided at the museum that every three years or so we're going to do a big summer exhibit we always have a great summer exhibit but this coming summer uh, you might remember that we did titanic a few years ago well this is the next big thing and this is the world's largest dinosaur it's a an exhibit from the american museum of natural history in new york and it uh, we're going to have a, a preview event for it on June 4th. It's for Director Circle members only. Uh, the exhibit opens to the public on the 5th. And so the best way to come to this preview is to become a Director Circle member. And it will be a lot of fun. Um, Amber, do you want to talk about uh, Sing With Me? Absolutely. Um, one of our uh, great programs coming up um, is a virtual author talk with um, Diana Lopez. Um, we will be celebrating Selena and um, her, one of uh, Diana Lopez's books is called Sing With Me. Um, and that is the story of Selena. And so we will have um, Diana Lopez with us on April 15th um, at 6 p.m. And that will be a, a virtual program. You may remember Diana Lopez from our Loco for Coco talk uh, that we had last year, and it was just absolutely great. And we are so excited to have uh, Diana back with us um, April 15th. So uh, that should be out in the newsletter and um, on some e-blasts. So be sure to sign up and register for that one. This one is a, another donation-based um, program. So hopefully we can uh, raise some more money for some more programs as well. All right, and in order to tell better stories and collect better objects, um, we do have to raise money. And Giving Day is April 14th, and please support us and our work here, which you are all are involved in. And um, this, is, this is a rendering of an idea that we have for the Natural Science Galleries within our master plan for exhibits. So great things coming, uh, help support us. And uh, the title of our phase one booklet that we created is conveniently reigniting curiosity. We want people to always look, look closer, take a closer look, look deeper at things and learn more about their own backyard, learn more about uh, this region that is Central Texas. That's great. Thank you so much, Trey. I know we're almost to 11 o'clock, but just wanted to open up and see if anybody had any more questions for Dr. Crumpton. I know I have one I've been hanging on to, but if anybody else um, has any questions as well, we'd be happy to hear those and um, we could uh, unmute and holler it out to Dr. Crumpton here, or I can absolutely read it from the chat as well. While everybody's thinking, Trey, I do have one more question for you. Um, I know you mentioned that uh, the Mayborn Museum is the official repository for the um, Mammoth National Monument. What exactly does that mean? And also, does being an official repository, does that um, give more prestige or, or clout to Baylor University or uh, just the museum itself? Well, it's definitely prestigious because uh, the National Park Service and the federal government has to be okay with um, letting you house their material. Uh, this this is now public material, uh, uh, and it so it's definitely prestigious. And we are we are official partners with it, Baylor is an official partner with the city and uh, with NPS. So, um, and if, if, if I'm correct, then being a repository means that this material automatically goes to us for storage and care because the Mammoth National Monument doesn't necessarily have facilities to prep fossils and, and store them the way they need to be. And the Mayborn Museum does have those facilities and has had a relationship with the Mammoth site all the way back into the into the 1970s. Oh, wow, that's amazing. And that just shows you 
um, what a great job y'all do um, over there on what I call that side of the building um, with all the uh, collection specimens um, with these bones that we um, are trusted with here. And that is just so amazing that we have such um, professional, skilled um, people and facilities that we are able to do that. And I think I saw one more question pop up in the chat. Um, do we have a large collection of mammoth fossils that are not currently on display? Yes, um, I'd say about 2,000 square feet of storage that's that's dedicated to to mammoths uh, in some form or fashion. Uh, a lot of that material is still in its plaster jackets from the from the 80s and 90s, uh, and we just haven't had uh, the staff time that it takes to crack those open and and do all of the work on the fossils. We have a lot of mammoth material that's not from Waco too. We have other things that were found around or that weren't found at the mammoth site. Uh, so we are working with the Mammoth National Monument and their paleontologists to be able to start prepping those fossils uh, and catch up. Oh, Takes wow. time and money. Yes, yeah, so hopefully whenever they do, um, we, we'll be able to uh, have a program watching them do some of that as well. And maybe they can walk us through uh, some of the preparation it takes, just like in um, the room you showed us the preparation table uh, that we have here in the museum. That, that's just so fascinating. And then I think we have one more and then we'll wrap up. Is there a way for the public to get a peek at those collections? There are ways. It's usually through a, a, an official research request. Uh, that's how we have to handle access to the collections because it's restricted access, but um, I'm sure there's a possibility of whether we're talking about how we prep fossils, which is what you were saying, or general collection tours, um, that those are possibilities, yeah. And that is so wonderful. And that's what we try to do here with our uh, um, mysteries of the museum as well, is to, uh, there's a lot of folks out there I know before I started working at, uh, at a museum, um, I didn't realize what all and how much just the vast uh, collections that museums do have that, um, you know, a lot of the general public don't get to see. So hopefully uh, with our Mysteries of the Museums and some of our other adult programs, we'll be able to, to catch a glimpse of some of those other awesome things that y'all take care of uh, in those collections. And uh, Dr. Crumpton, we just want to thank you so much for uh, giving us a sneak peek, giving us a tour, um, giving us a description of some of the things we have on display. And um, hopefully you will join us back for another Mysteries of the Museum soon. Sure, anytime. Thank y'all so much for joining us today. Hope you'll have a wonderful afternoon.